way. There is a word from the Lord. The word is found in 1 Samuel, the fourth chapter, verse 1 through 7, verses 1 through 7. The Bible says, and the word of Samuel came to Israel. Now Israel went out against the Philistines to battle and pitched beside Ebenezer. And the Philistines pitched in Aphek. And the Philistines put themselves in array against Israel. And when they joined battle, Israel was smitten before the Philistines. And they slew of the army in the field about 4,000 men. And when the people were come into the camp, the elders of Israel said, Wherefore, have the Lord smitten us today before the Philistines? Let us fetch the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord out of Shiloh unto us, that when it cometh among us, it may save us out of the hand of our enemies. So the people sent to Shiloh that they might bring from thence the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord of hosts, which dwelleth between the cherubims and the two sons of Eli, Hophni, and Phinehas were there with me, the Ark of the Covenant of God. And when the ark of the Lord came into the camp, all Israel shouted with a great shout so that the earth rang again. And when the Philistines heard the noise of the shout, they said, what meaneth the noise of this great shout in the camp of the Hebrews? <clears throat> and they understood that the ark of the Lord was coming to the camp. And the Philistines were afraid, for they said, God is coming to the camp. And they said, Woe unto us, for there hath not been such a thing heretofore. I would like to tag this message today. The presence of God makes the difference. The presence of God makes the difference. Father, your presence is already here. Just take us higher, I pray. Anoint us. Give us clarity of thought. Send an anointing that makes this task real easy. I pray, God, in Jesus' name, save somebody, deliver somebody, loose their chains, and set them free. In Jesus' name, amen. The presence of God makes the difference. In the second chapter of 1 Samuel, we meet Eli, the high priest. We meet his two sons, Hophni and Phinehas. The Bible says Eli's sons were wicked men. They had no reverence or respect for the Lord. Eli's sons, my brothers and sisters, was priests who would steal the offering bought for sacrifices. They would sleep with the women in the church. They did not believe in the promises of God. So God's promise to Eli was that he would have to die. And so my brothers and sisters, you need to understand that we must reverence and respect God can't be in the church doing things against the will of God. God let Eli know that I will wipe out your whole entire family line from the priesthood. And I'm going to raise up another faithful priest by the name of Samuel. Samuel will be the priest of God. God's judge and God's leader over Israel. And so then Samuel arrives on the scene, just as chapter 4 brings us to Samuel, perhaps the lowest point of Israel's life is in chapter 4. In chapter 4, the Philistines are closing in on Israel, and there is a battle at Ebenezer. You just read it in the text. And Israel, my brothers and sisters, is defeated. 
The Bible says they lost 4,000 men. 4,000 men was killed. It was a huge, major loss for Israel. And Israel asked themselves in verse 3, why did the Lord bring defeat upon us today? Right before the Philistines. Let us bring now the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord from Shiloh so that it may bring God's covenant and presence in our midst and handle our enemies for us. They only wanted God's purposes and his plans after their plans and their purpose failed. Israel was focused on more so a religious object rather than focusing in on God. Notice uh, how the Israelites are depending on uh, it rather than depending on him. Uh, uh, you need to understand that uh, you can't depend on it. You, you're depending on your job, but God is the provider. You're depending on your transportation, but God will supply all your needs. We depend on so many it's as opposed to depending on him. My brothers and sisters, you need to understand the ark was supposed to be the visible symbol of God's presence among the Israelites, but it was never meant to be a substitute for God himself. That picture of God on your wall is not a substitute for God. Uh, 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 your pastor, your, 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 your preacher, your evangelist, uh, your prophet is not a substitute for the real God, amen. Your, 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 your money cannot uh, be a substitute for the real God. Uh, that's reading Deuteronomy, the 20th chapter, verse 4 says, For the Lord your God is he that goeth with you to fight for you against your enemies to save you. Anytime you focus on a religious subject rather than the real God, you're substituting ritual for relationship. And I don't know about you, but I'm glad that I know him for myself. And, and, and I'm, not, I'm, I'm not religious. I have a real relationship. You can do anything religiously. Yeah, you can get up every morning and go to the health spa and exercise religiously. You can do anything. You can, you can go to the car wash religiously. You can read a book religiously. But how many know that God is calling for a relationship? Uh -huh. The very name of the ark implies relationship. It was called the ark of the covenant as a reminder of God's covenant relationship with Israel. Israel wanted God's blessings without the repentance unto God. And so many of us, my brothers and sisters, want God to just breathe on us and pour out blessings and give us things and protect me and keep me and bless me and all that. But a whole lot of folk have not yet repented to God. We want all the benefits, but we we don't want the repentance and the relationship. Have I got a witness here? And so God, God, my brothers and sisters, watch this, gets more glory in the defeat of carnal people than he would their victories. God is not interested in covering your sin. He's already been to the cross for that. But he will allow you to be exposed every now and then if you just want to use him as a spare. I just rose to tell somebody to stop using God as a spare and get in real relationship with God. Therefore, you're stored up on praise and you're stored up on prayer and you store it up on worship not just when trouble comes and we call his name because we need him right then and there the devil is a liar get in real relationship with him and you can call on his name 24 7 and let the devil know i'm in it but i'm coming out of it because god is on my side and i got a real relationship with god and so from then on the Philistines were, were winning the battle. The Israelites lost about 30,000 foot soldiers, the Bible says. And so the wife of Phinehas and, and, and said that she died. Uh, before she died, she said that God has forsaken us. He's taken his glory. His glory is gone away from us. It's called a word called Ichabob. Ichabob. Amen. Which means the glory is gone. The glory has departed. He has left us. And he left them as a result of disobedience. 
Yeah, 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 yeah. We must take, we must make sure, my brothers and sisters, that we don't try to manipulate the power of God. God uses us, but we cannot use him. Uh, he called us. We didn't call him. Uh, sometimes we say, I found Jesus. You ain't found Jesus. Jesus never was lost. You was the one lost. He found you. And so the Bible says in verse 11 that the ark of God was taken by the Philistines and, and Hophni and Phinehas were slain. Ah, you know why they were slain? Because they were playing with God. I've got some news for you, my brothers and sisters. Uh, don't play with God because God don't play. Did you hear what I'm saying? I'm almost through, y'all. I said don't play with God because God don't play. Watch this. After the Philistines got what they wanted, they got the Ark of the Covenant. They got what they wanted. They didn't want what they got. <laughs> y'all, 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 I'll, I'll explain it later. When, when they got God on their side, they, they were plagued with rats and disease and, and death until the Ark returned back to its rightful place in Israel. I believe COVID-19, my brothers and sisters, is a plague uh, throughout the world. It's getting our attention. Hopefully things are happening around us in our country that will make the church get back to putting God back in his rightful place, in his revered place, and stop competing, stop trying to be the Mr. Big Stuff in titles and positions and all the stuff that has uh, divided us. And this church don't like that church, and this church can't do this, and that one puts this one down, and they ain't saved over there, and we're the only ones saved. The devil is alive. God has sent a plague to get our attention. COVID-19 is not the only one that we're going to experience. But God sent me to tell somebody, amen, it's a plague to get our attention. The Philistines tried to capture someone else's God without real right relationship with God. And they, they had all kinds of problems after they bought the covenant in because they did not really reverence and respect God. God cannot be captured. Neither can God be fetched. They said, go fetch the Ark of the Covenant. God cannot be fetched. We got to respect and reverence God. We cannot put God in the box we want God in. You know, do it this way. Can't do it that way. Are you going to get, you know, uh, ostracized for doing it this way or that way? Stop putting God in the box. God ain't just in your church and your church alone. God ain't just in your organization. I wish I had a witness here. They ain't say, well, that organization don't believe the way we believe. They ain't say, God ain't, can't be put in a box. He's too big for a box, y'all. I wish I had somebody here. <laughs> but we want to box him into our own little, our own little confines and, and we're the only ones saved and we're the only ones that have the truth and, and I can't fellowship with you or I can't go to dinner with you or I can't deal with you because y'all do it this way and we do it this way stop putting God in a box he's too large for a box we can't use somebody else's prayer life to gain victory even though people are praying for us and their prayers work, amen, you got to pray for yourself. If you only invite God to meet you on your terms, don't be surprised, my brothers and sisters, if you invite God to meet with you on your terms, if he's a no-show. Uh, uh, I'm glad that God is the God of order and God gives us the steps that he wants us to walk in. And who do you think you are, Mr. Big Stuff, to meet God on your terms? I got a question. Uh, what cross did you hang on? How much blood did you shed? When did you die and rise again? Early one Friday morning, Sunday morning. Putting God in a box. Meeting God on your terms. God has some terms for us from Genesis to Revelation. And so my brothers and sisters, the ark ended up at Abinadab's house. It was there for 20 years. Then David wanted the ark brought back to the homeland, Jerusalem. David wanted the presence of the Lord back. Is there anybody under the sound of my voice? You went through a season where you did not feel God. You, you couldn't get a prayer through you. You didn't feel like praising. You didn't feel like praying. You didn't feel like going to church. Is there anybody that went through that cold, hard, dark season? You suffered inside it. But God told me to tell you, his presence is coming back. David wanted his presence back. A whole generation was raised in Israel without the glory of God. And so 
So David decides we got to get the ark back. So he decides we're going to transport the ark back the way I want it transported back. He had a group from the tribe of Levi transporting the ark the wrong way. According to the book of Exodus, the 25th chapter, the ark was to be carried on the shoulders of the priests. Uh, but here's how David did it. David decided to set it up on a new cart. David did what he saw the Philistines do. Let me pause right there and tell somebody, just cause somebody in the church is doing it that way and somebody else in the church is doing it this way and this organization is doing it that way and, and mama and them used to do it this way. You cannot do it the way that other folk are doing it. You got to do it the way God said to do it. He transported it on a new cart because that's the way he saw the Philistines do it. They gave it back to the Israelites on a new cart. The Philistines didn't know any better, but David knew better. So, so let me warn you, my brothers and sisters, that is a dangerous thing trying to bring Philistine philosophy in the church of the living God. It's a dangerous thing trying to manage the power of God. We want God to move. We want God uh, to, to, to do it our way. We want to do it. Uh, we want him to do it when we want him to do it, the way we want him to do it and how we want him to do it. But I stopped to tell somebody when God says move then you move just like that who do we think we are preachers get up all right calm down <laughs> I better leave that alone you when the Holy Ghost is moving don't stop the Holy Ghost when God is speaking let God speak only thing we need to do is incline our ear what God is saying. So, and so, uh, the new cop that's carrying the ark is on his way back to Jerusalem. Everything is going fine, my brothers and sisters, until it hit some bumpy road. It hit some rough road. How many know that uh, in this life that we live, we're going to hit some rough road, some bumpy road. How you going to handle it? How you going to handle it? How you going to act when you hit some bumpy road? When, when everybody turns their back on you? How you going to act when you find out some good friends are dogging you out? How you going to act when somebody gets a bad divorce? How you going to act? How you going to act? Are you going to turn your back on God? Or are you going to keep it moving? And so we're, here's what happened. They hit, they hit some bumpy road and, 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 and the cart begins to shake like it's getting ready to come off, uh, like the Ark of the Covenant is getting ready to come off of the cart. And so the Bible says, Uzziah put forth his hand to hold it on the cart to keep it from falling. He didn't mean no harm. He thought he was doing the right thing. But Uzziah touching the cart with unclean hands, it was in direct violation of the divine law, and God struck him dead immediately. Mm. A lot of people think, uh, that we're really getting by with doing things against the will of God and against the laws of God and against the word of God. But God sees all, God knows all, God's, God hears all. Nothing gets past God's scrutiny. God can speak to you in the midnight hour. God, the, but, but the beautiful thing I like about God is he sees all this and I'm not trying to say that you're not right. I'm, I'm just speaking. I'm just talking. Amen. Uh, but, but, but the beautiful thing I love about him is he knows all about our struggles, our low points in life, our, our every now and then making an error or a mistake or, or a sin. Amen. But yet, he still has grace. He still has mercy. His love does not change. His love does not fail us. Watch this. As I died immediately because his hands were clean, unclean, and, and he touched the, the ark of God. He touched the cart trying, he touched the ark of God trying to keep it from falling on him. Thought he was doing a good thing, but he got punished because his heart wasn't right. God, God said in Numbers, the fourth chapter, verse 15, if thou shalt touch any holy thing, thou shalt die. Failing to follow God's precise instructions would be seen as not obeying God's word. So David, David, David gets mad. I'm mad because my buddy's gone. God killed my buddy. He was just trying to help. 
Is there anybody in here? Come on, let's be honest. Amen. Sometimes we go through the bumpy roads in life and we don't understand what God is doing. And sometimes we get mad at the situation and sometimes we get mad at God. Hallelujah. Listen, I'm just, I'm just, I just keep it 100. Uh, uh, let's, 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 let's be real. We human beings. Sometimes when we're doing all the right things in church and look like other people are getting blessed and look like I'm still struggling and all, sometimes we don't understand God. Why, why am I going through this? Sometimes we get mad at God. Sometimes you get mad at God when loved ones die. Sometimes you get mad at God when you lose a job. Sometimes you get mad at God when somebody in your family got murdered. You get mad. Let's be real, my brothers and sisters. But I stop by to tell you, God's going to make up for it. If he got mad at God for killing Uzzah, even though he knew how to carry that ark, he knew the divine instructions in handling that ark. If he got mad and he said, I'm refusing to take this up any further. Sometimes we get hit in life with some serious, devastating stuff, and we refuse to praise God. We refuse to come to church. We refuse to read our Bible. We refuse to worship and praise and pray. Don't you let the devil put that on your heart. The Bible says then, Obed Edom's house gets the ark. Let's take him there. And when he goes to Obed Edom's house, over at Edom's house, began to be blessed. The presence of God was in his house. Everything in his house was blessed. Everything they touched was blessed because of the presence of God. I just rose to tell somebody, if you ain't been in the presence of God in a long time, you need to try it again. I'm telling you, uh, when you get in his presence, ask Isaiah. Uh, when you get in his presence, he don't show you other folks stuff. He shows you your stuff. And that's the beautiful thing I love about God. He don't beat you up your, over your head and punish you. He'll show you you. Isaiah said, woe is me when he got in the presence of God. I'm a man of unclean lips. Isn't that something how we got these little super sanctimonious people in the church that's always judging other folks' stuff? But when you get in the presence, they must not have been in the presence of God. Because when you get in the presence of God, God will show you you. He don't show me other fault. He might show me as a pastor some things, give me insight on some things, but not to be such a big judge. Amen. But when I'm in the presence of God, I want God to show me me. Amen, somebody. And so Obed-Edom's house was blessed because the presence of God was there. So, so watch this. David decides, oh, they've been blessed over there because the Ark of the Covenant it's in Obed-Edom's house. But I want some of these blessings now. So I guess he just pulled his big lip up and said, hey, I blew it, man. I, uh, I want that presence back. I want that covenant back. So he goes uh, to get the covenant and take it back to Jerusalem to experience the glory of God. And so as I close here, the ark is taken from Obed-Edom's house to Jerusalem. I, I believe this, my brothers and sisters, once you have been in the presence of God, people are going to smell the anointing on you. My God from glory. People are going to say, you have been in the presence of God. Amen. So just because the, 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 the Ark of the Covenant left Obed-Edom's house, his house was still blessed. I don't care who you are. If you are in the presence of God, his presence lingers. Yeah, y'all remember that movie called The War Room? And when the when, when, when lady had her little secret closet, she prayed in that little secret closet. She put all kind of little post-it notes on the wall. She prayed for everybody and everything. Amen. Somebody came to buy the house. They didn't even look at the whole house. They happened to go in that room. Her little post-it notes and all that stuff was off the wall by then. But they happened to go in that room and they felt something. They felt the presence of God because that woman called it her war room. She was in warfare against the devil, talking to God and getting in the presence of God and the presence lingered. Isn't that an awesome thing? That you can still have God's presence even when you're not in that place. His presence dwells there. And so David said, I got to go back to Jerusalem. So the ark is taken back to Jerusalem. Amen. And they process it. The front of the procession in the ark of the covenant, David, and 30,000 men. David's not wearing his K-1 
kingly priestly uh, 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 robe and his crown, but he's wearing an ephod, a linen ephod. David wanted all the people to know. He wanted to illustrate in front of the people, my brothers and sisters, that in the presence of God, I'm nobody, I'm nothing. I become low so that he can be high because he's king of kings. And in his presence, we're nothing but servants. Watch this, and I'm almost through, I promise. Everybody was enjoying the presence of God, the revival of Jerusalem. Everybody was having a great time. They were dancing in the streets of Jerusalem because the presence of God is back with us. Everybody was enjoying God's presence except for David's wife, Michael. Don't you let nobody kill your joy. Don't you let nobody steal your praise. The Bible says, David, dance before the Lord with all his might. Michael, 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 his wife, the daughter of Saul, she looking out the window and she saw King David leaping and dancing before the Lord and she despised him in her heart. When the Bible says he danced out of his clothes, he didn't literally dance out of his clothes. He just didn't have on his kingship stuff. He had on a linen ephod because he wanted to give God's presence glory. Every now and then, when we come back to church or right there where you are, you need to make sure you put your praise garment on. Amen, somebody. I don't know about you, but you need to understand that God deserves our praise. Uh, I don't know about you, my brothers and sisters, but when you've been down and out, when you haven't felt the presence of God in a long time, and all of a sudden, the thing you've been praying for comes back. Your joy comes back. I rose to tell somebody, dance in his presence. God has showed up and delivered you. Dance in his presence. God has made a way out of no way. Dance in his presence. When God has forgiven you when you know good and well, you did not deserve to be forgiven because you kept on and on doing it over and over and God forgave you anyway. Dance in his presence. God has healed your body when the doctor showed you the x-rays and said, I done had many cases die with this same thing. And all of a sudden you go back to the doctor and he showed you a new x-ray that he can't believe. And he tells you, I don't know what happened. You ought to dance right there in the presence of God in the doctor's office. When you thought he left you all by yourself and he shows up and he assures you, I'm with you always. Not just now, but even to the end of the world. Dance in his presence. Don't let nobody or nothing or no thing stop you from dancing in the presence of God. Whoever's going through whatever you're going through right now, I challenge you to get in the presence of God and begin to dance in his presence. Family members might call you crazy. What are you doing? What are you, I'm dancing in the presence of God. What are you doing that for? Because I know God's about to turn it around for me. to the job got your headphones on listen to listen to the gospel music and all of a sudden a hallelujah comes out of your mouth and, and your co-workers look at you like what in the world is going on say excuse me I know I'm on the job but I had a can't help it moment because God just spoke to me and I gotta give him some praise dance in his presence don't let nobody stop you if you go to one of those churches Let's say we don't do that here. You welcome here. Dance in his presence. Y'all know old Shouting John on Shirley Caesar's album told them big time deacons that came to his house and told him the kind of carrying on you're doing. We don't do that in this church. 
You got to stop that. He said, hold on, hold on, hold on. Y'all don't know what God has done for me. Look at all this land he gave me. I have been blessed to raise all my children, send them all through school. Look at this farm. Look at my crops and all that stuff. You th I ain't think I ain't going to praise God? The devil is alive. Brother Deacon, with your cool self, hold my mule. I've been plowing, but I'm getting ready to show y'all how to do it. Dance in his presence. Right where you are, you ought to give God praise. His presence is back. His power is back. His anointing is back. His glory is back. His touch is back. His revival is back. His restoral is back. His renewal is back. His favor is back. His grace is back. stating stuff in 2020 but God sent me to tell you that his presence is coming back and I challenge you right now to put a praise on it right where you are let God know I'm serious about this and even in advance I'm going to praise you is there anybody that has a dance in advance I wish I had somebody is there anybody that has a shout in advance anybody can lift your hands in advance anybody can give him glory in advance, hands in his presence. Because the presence of the Lord makes the difference in our lives. Somebody wrote a song, just having him there made the difference in my life. Y'all can make me dance now. Y'all better cool it, cool it, cool it. You can make me shout all by myself. And some of y'all living at home by yourself, if you feel the presence of God, I just heard the Holy Ghost say, if you get up and give God praise right where you are, he's going to turn something around before midnight. Get your peace back! 